performance report on the Gameco Commander 3 and on Contract 220 in the massive channel tunnel rail link project that connects the center of London to the English Channel Tunnel and Europe. Our location was the twin tunnels of the Stratford Box near London, England. The project was to place the tunnel track bed and two walkways. In total, there was approximately 105 kilometers of slip form paving in 35 kilometers of tunnel. Down in the Stratford Box was the concrete batch plant that was sold by Gameco International LTD and the unique duct trucks that were used to transport the concrete material to the paver and of course the entrance to the twin tunnels. There was a number of logistical considerations going into this project. Work began on these tunnels three years before the slip forming process. More than a year before the slip forming, Bill Brunden, the tunnel agent, Peter Davidson, the paving subcontractor, and Rory Keel from Gameco International came to Gameco headquarters in Ida Grove, Iowa, USA to visit with our engineering team about their needs for the tunnel. The solution was one machine for the project, and that machine was the Gameco Commander 3. Leica Geosystems would provide the stringless solution with their three-dimensional system. We visited with Bill Brunden, the tunnel agent. I work for Nishimatsu Cementation Skanska joint venture um, on the Channel Tunnel Rail Link contract 220 at Stratford Box. Um, the joint venture I work for has done the tunnelling from this point into King's Cross, into the centre of London. Um, we've been here now for some three years working and we're in the last phases where we're concreting the track bed and the tunnel walkways. I'm a tunnel agent um, and I've done all the planning works for the lining and for the concreting and I've been involved with purchasing of all the equipment, the trucks and the paver um, and choosing the subcontractor and getting the work going. Um, at this point we're supervising the subcontractor and finishing off the works. Nishimatsu um, are one of the bigger contractors on the, on the Channel Tunnel Rail Link. This is the second phase of the work uh, which basically takes the rail line from France over the Thames into central, of, central London. And is this the same vehicle that we see in the channel? The that trains, the... yeah, the trains that are coming from uh, the Channel Tunnel going through Folkestone and coming up to London through the, to the south of London will now be able to cross the Thames and come to the north of London, um, saving quite considerable time and making it a much quicker route into London. Okay, can you, uh, can you describe the tunnels to us? Uh, standpoint of two tunnels and their sizes. Yeah, we have a, an upline tunnel and a downline tunnel. Uh, obviously trains going into King's Cross and trains coming out when it's finished. The tunnels are, are seven and a half kilometers long uh, from this point, uh, a 7.15 meters in diameter, that's internal diameter. Um, they're built of tunnel segments, precast concrete segments that were laid behind a tunnel boring machine. Uh, the tunnel boring machines obviously are long gone. Uh, they, they would dismantled a year ago approximately, um, hence we're doing the concreting phase without, without them here. Okay, since we're talking about the tunnels, uh, actually it's not that big of a tunnel and the tunnel size gave you challenges. Um, it's, it's big for a, an English tunnel, um, it's big for a railway tunnel. Um, we don't have many railway tunnels of this size in England. Um, the method we've chosen to concrete the tunnels um, has caused some challenges. Um, the equipment we've got is pretty big um, and there's no spare room at all. Um, for example, we're passing two large trucks in the tunnel. The trucks are two meters wide um, and we have to do that about 700 mil off the floor to get enough width in the tunnel. Um, so the tunnels are small for the equipment, but saying that we've sized everything up to make them as big as possible so that the concreting work proceeds as quickly as possible. So almost everything that goes into the tunnel has to come, it backs out, you cannot turn around. Yes, we're not allowed out at the far end. At King's Cross, where the, the tunnel comes into the open in central London, we're not allowed out that way at all. So everything goes in the tunnel has to come out.
Well, first of all, let's talk about what you are concreting. We've got three phases in, in each tunnel. Um, we start off concreting the track bed, which is the foundation for the rail track, which will be laid by the next contract. The next phase are both walkway structures that are above the, walk, above the track bed. We lay each of the three phases separately. Track bed first, one walkway, and then the second walkway. So we have three passes of the tunnel uh, with the concreting equipment. Okay, the track bed, uh, what are the dimensions of that? The running surface is about 2.5 meters wide. Obviously it's being laid in a circular tunnel. So in the center of the tunnel, it's about 600 millimeters deep. Um, it's approximately 1.2 cubic meters of concrete per linear meter. Okay, and then on that bed, uh, the rail will be laid? Yeah, the rail contractor, the next contracts, uh, will come in and he will lay track, shim it up and level it accurately, and then cast concrete around it to cast it into the tunnel. Anything that's, that, uh, that you ran into that was challenges, like the ducts work and the, and the cabling? And describe any of that for us? Um, yeah, in, in the tunnels there have been some 2,000 lengths of uh, ducting. Um, we've got three types. We've got a 250 diameter pipe. We have 110 and a, and a 90 mil diameter duct. Um, these are obviously something that you don't want to have to mess around with when you're paving. Um, but the subcontractor and ourselves, we, we managed to come up with simple methods to, to allow the ducts to be put in without stopping or delaying the paving progress. On that uh, bed, there's actually a channel underneath the bed. Yeah, in the center of the track bed, there's, uh, that's where the 250 pipe is. Okay. Um, every 75 meters, it's exposed in a, in a manhole or an inspection chamber. Um, and again, that was all we all managed to lay all of that without delaying once the, the paver. We also visited with Peter Davidson, the subcontractor, responsible for the slip forming, and his foreman, John Crouch. Peter said that they didn't want anybody holding them up. Call that, uh, this is the only way to take this contract on was to do everything. There was no point in taking on just the actual... We are slip forming contractors, but I could see from early days, if we had other people fixing pipes or fixing steel for us, they'd hold us up. So we just took on the whole lot. Right from the minute it comes out that batch, well, from the minute the lorry tips the aggregate in the yard, we take over. Mix it, haul it, lay the pipes, haul the pipes in there. Quite a logistics with getting all the materials in there, pipes. Are you responsible for the batch plant and the materials? Yeah. What's the longest you've paid without stopping the machine? That, that would probably be... Ten and a half days. Um, on the ten and a half days we did the, the track slab, we did stop um, a couple of times to weld some braces on, but no no major stops. There was no cleaning off the machine, no... no no um, stop end or start end in a slab. So, so ten, the, ma the ten machinery days, yeah. we've slacked for this project has all been unbelievable. Nothing really, no serious breakdown. Very lucky. Uh, how many hours has the Commander 3 got on the clock? 5,000? Oh, more than that. I'm not, I'm not sure what's on it. it. It's been unbelievable. Just kept going and going and going. The Commander 3 always ran in the transport mode. Once the track bed was complete, the paver would return to slip form the two walls, which would be used for walkways. The commander would not see daylight again until the job was finished. Once the track bed is finished, the paver is outside, so they put the walkway mold on it. The paver then tracks in um, and paves a, a, a one and a half, two kilometer section. And at that point, it stops. They change the mold in the tunnel. It tracks back and does the other wall and does a, a three to four kilometer section. And then obviously the situation carries on. The mold is changed and it, and it does the next section of three to four kilometers on the other wall. So the paver never comes out at that point, no. Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit about the wall that we saw today. You call it the bigger wall. Yeah, we're, we're casting there the, the emergency walkway or the evacuation walkway. Um, it's the larger of the two. It's slightly more challenging than the smaller walkway uh, in that the horizontal surface and the vertical surface um, are varying all the time depending on the tunnel alignment or the tunnel cans. That means that the walkway can go from about a 1.5 meter width on the top surface down to about a 1.1 meter width. Uh, it's varying all the time. 
we like the idea of slip forming primarily because it would have been quick, um, it would have drastically reduced the number of men um, and, and the safety aspects of, of the operation. Um, but originally we, we had no, no idea that the thing would work. Um, you saw from earlier that the wall is high up on the side wall of a tunnel being cast against a circular base. So we believed that the, the structure would not stand up in the, in the tunnel, we, we believed it would fall down. Um, that was the um, basic factor which slowed us down in making decisions to go with slip form paving. Once you decided to go ahead with it, uh, did you have any surprises or problems? Before we decided to, to go paving, um, we did a number of trials. We, we actually built some dummy tunnels on the surface where we, we erected some segments to imitate the tunnel. Um, and we used a smaller paving machine to do extensive trials to see if it was possible. Uh, we tested the reinforcement, the dowels, the ways of actually getting the concrete to stick to the, to the wall. Um, we wouldn't make the decision to pave until we'd confirmed in our own minds that it was physically possible. This was shown by the trials and, and the trials clearly showed that, that it would work. Um, and that's quite an important thing to, have to, to make clear at this point. The slip form mold for the wall had a hydraulically adjustable side plate and a hydraulically adjustable top plate. Peter said that they had the foresight to discuss this when they were in Ida Grove and to have this designed and built by Gameco. Because uh, the counts in the tunnel go like this, that, that wall has got to be that someone can step right out the train onto that wall. So that has got to run with the train and then with the tunnels doing that obviously the wall he comes away from the tunnel, comes back in, height difference with the train going around, but you're doing that look, the wall's coming out from the tunnel wall, and the height is getting higher, so that was quite a mould. Uh, how much strokes in it? About 500. 500 mil up and down, what about the sideways? About 500. About 500, so it's quite a mould. Bill said that a jack system was added to keep the wall against the tunnel structure. Yeah, we have a sort of a hydraulic jack system with wheels that come from the body of the paver to the opposite wall, to the wall that we're paving. Um, again, trial and error showed that we needed something to make it more stable. Uh, we're running the paver legs quite, quite tight in. I mean, they're running on a two and a half metre wide road. Um, with the considerable variation of, of the tunnel alignment and the cants, the, the wall goes all over the place. There's no straight lines really in that tunnel. Uh, and, and, the, and the structure you saw basically is helping to make it stable and keep the wall standing up. If the paver started moving off without that structure, the wall would follow and it wouldn't stay up on the sidewalk. Is, the, is there any uh, major differences between the, the tall wall and the small wall other than uh, size as far as slip forming? Um, your production's more? The small wall's a bit harder to set out because the way it's been designed, it hasn't got a variable top surface, so we don't have, it's not so easy to control its position on, with three dimensions. Um, it's quite hard to explain. And the other thing is that the volume of that is 0.7 cubic meters a meter as opposed to 1.1, 1.2 cubic meters a meter. So it's quite a lot smaller. The mixed design, again, was a trial and error thing. We, we uh, went to a couple of consultants who designed it for us, but at that point we didn't know if it would pave, if it would stand up. So again, the trials, the trials on site um, fine-tuned it. Um, we went through actually about five stages of trialing, um, two at Stratford and two at the other contract at Dagenham. Um, and after some 400 cubic meters of concrete going through the machine, um, we managed to fine-tune it and come up with what we're using at the moment. What um, is that, yeah. Well, we're using 20 mil limestone, um, 10 mil limestone, <coughs> and two types of sand. We're using a, a, a clever super plasticizer and an air in training agent. Um, and the combination, and, and obviously water, adding water in the correct proportions, gives us something that we can work with and make stand up on the, on the wall. One of the reasons for the project's success was that they chose to go without string line. They chose the Leica 3D system, interfaced with the Gameco G21 controller on the Commander 3. Peter and John said that it couldn't have been done any other way with any other paver. 
Well, it's quite an experience. <laughs> we we are string line people. <laughs> 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 but could you have done it the 24 7 no Was you had to you could, had to have the lycra have have there's the lycra. no ifs or buts no, no the setting a string line in there would have been a major major headache not to say it couldn't have been done but it would have been and to keep ahead of it yeah well you'd have dump trucks passing it excavators swinging round no, it, it would have been like a major it, problem like it. and it would have been hard to, to survey and set up Bill Brunden agreed that 3D was the only way to go. Well, we wanted to eliminate surveying staff, um, and so we couldn't go on with using the traditional string line methods because uh, we wouldn't have had enough surveyors to set it and get it all ready in time. We used a 3D system when we were boring the tunnels with the TBMs, um, and it was a natural step to, to use a 3D system on the paver. Uh, the choice of Leica followed on really from Gameco's recommendation. It was the only set of 3D equipment that was uh, working with Gumeco at the time. Have you been satisfied with it? Um, yeah, obviously there's a big learning curve with our surveyors operating it. Um, but it's really been quite remarkable. They've picked it up. Um, they had about two days training with, with Leica. And from that point, they were on their own. Um, over the nine months or so, I think we've had one day of problems where we had uh, a lot of talking with Leica. And for the rest of the time, we've managed to solve all the problems few of them um, ourselves. And that has to be great time savings without messing around with string lines. Oh, it's, it, it, yeah, it's a, it's a very good system. Um, I don't think we could have done it any other way. The Commander 3 ran around the clock, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Bill said production on the three phases of slip forming was impressive. Um, so there's really no comparison. Uh, the, the time we've saved and also the, the manpower we've saved um, has been very considerable. Peter and John said that the tunnel took some getting used to, but they would do it all over again. Oh yes, without a doubt. Anywhere in the world. Yeah, yeah anywhere, anywhere in the world, we wouldn't bat an eyelid at it. Uh, once they're up and going, that interesting work, and you can plan your jobs, and you don't have to worry about the weather. You and it's what there, it's what our company is all about is high production. We are really high production boys and it's really what we're into. This has been a performance report on the Commander 3 paving in the twin tunnels of the Stratford Box near London, England. Gomeco, the worldwide leader in concrete paving technology.